Gallatin County Health Officer Matt Kelly on the show. Thanks for your time, Matt. We appreciate it. Good morning. Glad to be here. So uh, you got to be like one of the busiest people in Bozeman right now. What time do you start your day? Oh, it's kind of around the clock these days. I don't know that my day ever really ends, to tell you the truth. <laughs> How long have you been the health officer for uh, Gallatin County? I'm in my 11th year. We've been here. I got here in, in the early part of 2010. So, and is that like, how do you get your job? Are you appointed? You're, are you, uh, you know, are you voted in? How does that Yeah, work? yeah, it's a good question. So in Montana, we have a decentralized public health system. That means local boards of health. So our local board of health, which is appointed by the Gallatin County Commission and the Bozeman City Commission, um, hires a health officer. That's by state statute. Uh, so the, the Board of Health is my boss. Um, they, their responsibility throughout Montana is to go out and hire somebody uh, with the qualifications to serve as health officer. What's your background? Like, what, how do you get that job? Well, I, I, I've worked in public health in a variety of settings. I, I was in West Africa in the Peace Corps and came back and did my graduate work at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, and from that, I worked for the District of Columbia um, city government. I was working for the city manager in public health and public mental health systems. Um, and, and from that job, um, came to this job about 10 years ago. Let's get into yesterday's meeting before we talk about Friday's rescheduled meeting. And we just wanted to hear from you. What was your take on what happened yesterday at the Commons? Well, you know, the Board of Health asked the staff and uh, to look for ways that we could really accomplish two things. One is to to interrupt disease transmission, to slow down this pandemic, to slow down the virus, and also um, ways that we can keep our economy going, keep our businesses open. And we don't really have very many tools that can do both of those things. Face masks is one of those things. If you put on, if you put on a face covering, you really re- you can reduce the risk to the people around you. It's really a, a sign of courtesy and respect to those around you. And so we brought the 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 the, the um, emergency rule uh, draft emergency rule to the board. Um, we wanted to have the meeting uh, at the Commons because we wanted to open it up to as many people as possible, as much public comment as possible. But we needed we, we knew we needed to do that within the the rules uh, put out there by the by the governor and his directive and the board of health in their emergency health rule, which re- requires social distancing in in groups more than fifty. We thought we had a pretty good plan. We had we had a hundred chairs uh, in the room that were socially distanced. We found the biggest room in the county that could accommodate our our, our electron our uh, technology needs. We had we had video screens set up in the lobby in case we had people who couldn't get into the room so they could watch the meeting and then come in and take their turn and have public comment. And we had audio set up outside the outside the building so just in case we didn't have room in the lobby, people outside could also hear what was going on in the meeting. They could wait in line in an orderly way and get their turn to come in. And the board was committed to staying as long as they needed to yesterday to hear from everybody. Unfortunately, what happened is we had some individuals who just – um, did not did not um, follow directions and and came into the main room and then refused to leave when Sheriff Kukin asked them to leave, refused to leave when Commissioner Skinner asked them to leave. At that point in time, the board didn't have much option. We, there really didn't seem to be a viable option to have a a, a a public meeting that was in violation of the governor's directive and the board's own emergency rule. Um, and so we we and then it started to get unruly. It started to get fairly hot. Hostel. Um, I was called the names uh, as I was walking in through the parking lot on the way out. It was it was kind of sad to me. I mean, I think as a community, uh, we should be able to come together and listen to one another. Um, and what happened what happened yesterday was not that. There was not a lot of listening going on. And so the board made a decision to to move the meeting. Um, they're gonna they're gonna move forward though. Uh, they're they're not gonna be bullied by this. They're they're gonna move forward and they're gonna um, have the meeting on on Friday at 7 a.m. And again, their goal is to listen. Uh, they want to hear. They want to hear from people. And in in the spirit of doing that, it'll be a virtual meeting, and we'll have it. We'll have people will be able to access it um, either through the telephone or, or virtually through a computer uh, and make their public comment. Because unfortunately, yesterday we were not able to hear public comment because of the tenor. Of the meeting. So for the meeting on Friday, uh, how many public comments are you going to take? Is that going to be restricted? How is that going to work? We're going to we're going to 
take as many as, as can come. There will probably need, have to be a restriction on a, on a time limit so we can get to everybody. Um, but I think the board is ready to take public comment for as long as it takes. So if you have 150 people, you'll take 150 comments? We're, we're going to do our best. I mean, we're going we're gonna to move through it. The board wants to hear from people. We're also providing an option for people to make public comment uh, in writing. So people really want to make sure that their public comment is heard. They can, if you go to healthygallatin.org, there's, there's um, some options for making public comment. You don't have to call in. Um, you can also send your public comment in writing. So yesterday, uh, some of the schools sent out a survey, and some folks uh, were concerned about the survey because on that survey, it had already said that the county had made the decision to make masks mandatory. And so there was a feeling among a lot of people that, hey, the board's really already made the decision. Uh, They're just doing this to, you know, placate everybody and let everybody talk. But in reality, uh, the decision's already been made. Can Can you speak to that? Well, that's not true. I mean, the, the board the board is is taking public comment. I can't speak to communications that come from in the school districts. We have been talking to school districts, and frankly, we've been getting uh, requests from school districts to for, from some school districts to to go a little bit further than the than the current rule goes, and to have masks in kindergarten through twelfth grade. Um, we made the decision to to have the, the the emergency rule cover middle school and high school. Um, the the board, you know, this is a pretty contentious issue. I will tell you that board members are hearing about this um, on an ongoing basis throughout their daily lives. Just people talking to them as as people in the community. We were getting significant amounts of unsolicited public public input on this uh, in favor of a mask man- mandate um, early on in the in before before we even decided to move ahead with a board meeting. So, you know, I, what I can say is that the board is really interested in hearing from the community on this. They've done a lot of work to look at the science, uh, but they also live in the community and they and they know what they see and they know what they hear. So some of them some of them may come into this um, with some questions and with some, with some concerns. And I think what their main goal is is to find ways that we can reduce disease transmission without shutting down businesses. Um, you know, we're we're in a pretty precarious point right now. We have more cases, uh, we have more hospitalizations than we have had at any point in time. Um, when we were at this point in March, we had some advantages. Number one, the weather wasn't so great. People weren't out. Number two, we were about to send MSU students home. MSU students are about to come back here. Number three, we had Yellowstone Park closed. Right now, Yellowstone Park is open, and it is and business is booming down there. Um, and number four, we were about to go into a community-wide stay-at-home order that really suppressed disease transmission. And I don't know if that's on the agenda, and I don't think anybody wants that uh, coming up. So, you know, if we're going to um, reduce disease transmission here, if we're going to if we're going to get this under control, uh, we're going to have to take it seriously and, and crossing our fingers and closing our eyes and hoping it goes away isn't going to work. I just came out of our, of our morning huddle with our with our contact tracers. We have 31 cases in the pile that we haven't got to from yesterday and there's already 15 piled up today. We're seeing widespread community transmission of this disease and we're seeing it in Bozeman, we're seeing it in Belgrade, we're seeing it in Three Forks, we're seeing it in, in Gateway, we're seeing it in Big Sky, we're seeing it in West Yellowstone, we're seeing it come out of, of restaurants, we're seeing it come out of educational settings, we're seeing it come out of healthcare settings. We have significant numbers of healthcare providers who are in quarantine because they've been in close contact with somebody as a case. This is really serious. We're we're at a point where our, our healthcare system is is trying is trying to make make plans for what's going to happen if this gets worse. We don't want to end up where Houston is. We don't want to end up where Florida is, where we're seeing hospitals start to fill up. We only have one hospital, and so we're trying to give the board we're, we're trying to give the board um, options uh, to to avoid that. And and the and the and the face covering rule is just one part of that. I know that's creating a lot of attention, but there's a lot of other things that we need to be, need to be paying attention to as well. Now, with all those cases, though, I mean, there's no question that we're getting more, you know, there's more tests being done, so we're getting more positive cases. But with all of those, we haven't had any more deaths. We've only had one death in five months. And we, we our hospitalizations, I think we've had, what, 11 in five months? Um, so, like, that seems to be a little bit of a disconnect with uh, just because there's more cases doesn't mean it's more deadly. Yeah, and I think it, I think it's, I think you need to be 
careful about thinking that because it hasn't happened here, it can't happen here. It's the same virus that's affecting Texas. It's the same virus that's affecting Florida, and it can happen here. And I think it's our it's our it's our duty to talk tell, talk to the community about that. Um, if 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 there is a feeling, if the community has a feeling that this that we're somehow impervious to this and it can't happen here, and our and our hospital can't get overwhelmed, that's unfortunate. That's that's a that's going to be um, a, a problem moving forward. We have to take this seriously, or, we're, or we're, we're, we really run a really high risk of getting overwhelmed. So, if masks are mandated, will there be will there be any restrictions on the type of masks? Well, n- not really. The, the, we we we'll, we'll need people that we want. The, the rule will um, outline that we want m- multiple ply masks, and but they can come from, you know, commercial commercially manufactured masks or homemade masks. The point is to get a face covering over your face, and and the reason that's important is because it really reduces the the the, the trajectory and the and the distance that your the droplets go when when you're exhaling or coughing or sneezing, and with a really insidious part of this virus is that for a lot of people they have mild symptoms they 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 may not even know that they're that they that they have the disease but we're we're learning that they can transmit the disease we're seeing people with 20 30 close contacts come in um, that is creating issues right now for the for for Bozeman Health where there are people who are in their staff who are in the community are coming to contact um, with known cases and have to be quarantined um, and that's that's creating challenges challenges for them. Um, so, you know, I think the, the, there will be some requirements, but the, the, the main thing is to get a covering over your face to slow down that droplet trajectory and distance. And if we are um, going to be wearing masks, how often do we need to change these masks? Do we need to clean these masks? Yep. You need to, you need to keep them clean and you need to try to, try to avoid touching them, um, touching the outside of them. You know, um, good mask hygiene, good mask use is really important. The other thing I'll say in this is, you know, the board wants to hear about this. The board wants to to listen to what these concerns are. Um, they'll make a decision one way or the other. Um, if they decide to implement the the rule, it still really lies with the community. If the community is willing to do this, um, then w- then it will it will provide some benefit. If the community is not willing to do this, then it won't. And we're, we're going to run a higher risk. We don't have many tools left. Our contact tracing, um, our contact tracing team is, has been working as hard as it can for four to four to five months. Um, we we have been talking about hand washing. We have been ta- we have been doing everything we know how. Um, the the face covering um, issue, the face covering, um, putting putting something over your face when you're in an indoor. Remember, we're talking about when you're in an indoor public setting. If you're leaving your house and you're going to go on, a, if you're going to go outside, this mask rule does not impact you. Um, if you are younger than the age age of 12, this mask rule is is not is not a is not a requirement. It is for people who are 12 and older when they go into indoor public environments. And I'll tell you, when I'm looking at this public comment, what I'm seeing is people who have um, really really significant health risks. I'm seeing cashiers at at, at grocery stores, and it seems like. Um, at the, who are at really high risk and are doing as much as they can uh, to re- reduce reduce their reduce their risk, but they could die from this. And, and you mentioned that we've been we've been pretty successful in preventing hospitalizations. We've been pretty successful in preventing deaths. One of the reasons for that is that, is that we have had predominantly young people being affected by it. What we see, what we're seeing happening in Billings, where you have this ripping through a, 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 a long-term care facility, then you start to see mortality piling up. And when you start to when you start to see that, that that becomes really concerning. And so we've so far been successful keeping out of those vulnerable populations. But the more spread we see in the general population, the more risk we're we're at to, for that ending and us having uh, more people getting sicker. But if you if you look at the stats, like from the state, isn't it about a at least a third, I don't think it's a half, but about a third of the deaths that have come uh, have been in like healthcare facilities, right? It's the, it's the more, more vulnerable population. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, and that's and that's. But you know who works in those in those healthcare facilities? Young people who are out in the community. Um, you can't just come entirely wall those those populations off. And so, if we're going to protect those populations, um, taking some simple precautions like putting a mask on when we're going into a public setting is one thing we can do to protect the overall community and protect those populations. And the other thing I would say is, while the mortality is really significant in those populations, we are also seeing young people in the hospital. We're seeing people affected at all ages. This virus is really d difficult to deal with because it affects people differently, and you can't tell who it's going to affect how. When you say you've seen people in the hospital, though, are you talking about just people coming in because they got sick or people actually being hospitalized? People being hospitalized is what we've I'm only, talking about. But we've only had 11 hospitalized in five months. Abs I mean, we have we have had good luck. We have had good, fortunate luck, and that's due to a lot of hard work. But if you look out nationally, if you look at what's happening in Houston, if you look at what's happening in Florida, hospitalizations are rising. Hospitalizations are a lagging indicator here. I understand that people want to look at what's happening in their local community, but this is the same virus that is filling up hospitals in many other states in the, in the, in the, in the country. This is not a different virus, and we are not immune to it. I just want people to understand that, that we do not, just because we live in Montana does not mean that we are safe. We have, we are at risk, and we, and we need to take precautions. I guess, um, yeah, and I, I hear what you're saying there, I guess, but for people looking at the statistics, not just in Montana, but over the, you know, throughout the United States, I mean, the, the death rate has gone way down. I think we're around, what, 900 in the last few days nationwide, where, you know, two in April, it was like up over 2,000. So people look at that and go, hey, it looks like we're doing better. Yeah, I, I guess that's that's really interesting that we're get, we've gotten to a point where having between 500 and 1,000 deaths a day is somehow a, a good thing um, that that we're that we're feeling like because we're, we're only 500 to 1,000 Americans are dying a day that it's something that we can we can sort of stop paying attention to yeah, somehow but... or we can we can stop worrying about this is a serious disease um, we, we we have lost we have lost over 130,000 Americans in five months to this we and you and while you're saying that hospitalizations are going down. That's not true in many of the states that started to see the uptick slightly before us. We're seeing hospitalizations go up in Texas and Florida. We're seeing ICUs in, in Houston being pushed to capacity. We're seeing we're seeing closures happening in many other states that are slightly ahead of us in this. It is absolutely true that we have been fortunate here. We 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 have, but that has been for some from for some very specific reasons. One of them is we had a stay-at-home order in place that really drove disease disease down to almost nothing here in Gallon County. We went four to five weeks without detecting a case, and we were doing significant amounts of testing. Our, 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 the percentage of, of tests that we have now that are coming back positive are on some days approaching 10 percent. That's an indication that the disease has genuinely increased in the community. When we, were, when we were testing for four to five weeks and not finding cases, when our sewage, when our sewage sampling was not showing disease, we were in pretty good good shape, but that was because we had a stay-at-home order in place. That is no longer the case. We are seeing widespread transmission, and it is up to the community how we're going to react to this. Um, we have um, a, we're at a point now with Yellowstone open, with MSU potentially coming back, and us wanting to send our kids back to school. Uh, we're not at the same point we were in March when we were about to go in, under a stay-at-home order. Well, yeah, I get that, and uh, and I'm just throwing out, you know, some of these things. This is what uh, some of it is for me personally. Some of it is from from what you know people have been reaching out to me with questions for you on. Uh, but it seems like to me, when you're looking at the overall numbers, um, the the numbers people aren't dying. That yes, the number, the testing numbers are going up, but the the death percentage is going down. And while yes, 900 people did die, and that's not a good thing. It's better than 2,000, and that makes it look like we're making progress on this, not the other way around. I understand. I mean, I guess having 900 people die is better than having 2,000 people die a day. It, it is. It, we, I, the point is. This, rem this continues to be a dangerous virus. It continues to be killing Americans every day across the country. We're at your local health department. We're trying to give our local Board of Health tools 
uh, in order to slow down disease transmission. I will tell you, we have seen rapid and, and widespread increase in the number of cases, and I'm really worried wh where that's where that's headed uh, down down the road. I'm really worried about if this gets into long-term care facilities, if this gets into our older population, what impact that's going to have. I understand uh, people are looking at what's happening locally here, but I really encourage them to, to look at what's happening in other states and uh, states that aren't that far away. Look at what's happening in Utah. Look at what's happening in Texas. Look at what's happening in Florida. Look at what's happening in Louisiana. Look at what's happening in other states. I, I, I understand that there's a that there's a, 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 a temptation to look at what's happening here and be comforted by that. Our job is to look at what's happening nationally and to follow advice about what's happening nationally as well. And what we're seeing happening across the country is cases are rising, hospitalization is rising, and deaths and, and, and mortality is, is rising um, in, in, in many states, including the, the ones in the, in the South and the West. With more cases and more of those being some of the younger people, um, is there some herd immunity that's going to be happening? What is your take on that? No, you don't get to herd immunity until you've got, you know, between at least 60 percent of the population who have been, has been exposed. And I haven't seen any studies that have indicated that we're, we're much past 5 or 10 percent of the population, if that. We have a long way to go before we get to herd immunity. Um, and, and so, we, we, you know, we, and if we, if we just let the disease rip through the community, we're looking at, at many, many deaths. If we don't take any precautions to slow this down, um, we're, we're looking at a much higher number of deaths than we have currently. What about the antibody test? Is that something that you recommend for people who believe that they've already had it? You know, it depends on the test. I mean, there's two things about the antibody test I would caution. One is there's a lot of tests out there. Make sure you're really clear. Probably talk to your health care provider about getting one that, uh, if possible, is FDA approved and has has good efficacy. So make sure you get a good test. The second thing I would say is we still, because the virus is so new, um, we've only been living with it for six or eight months, um, we don't yet know, it's impossible to know how long immunity lasts. So even if you even if you have those antibodies, we can't really say for sure what, uh, what that means for a person long term because we just haven't lived with the virus long enough to understand that. All right, Matt, um, a final question for you. We've been talking with Gallatin County Health Officer Matt Kelly. Um, schools, uh, that's coming up. Where where do you fall on schools opening up in the fall? You know, I, 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 I like the fact that the schools are reaching out to parents and talking to parents. I was talking to uh, my sister, who is an educator in another state, uh, yesterday. Um, it is tough when you have a if you're a if you're a teacher um, who is who is potentially immunocompromised or has a has a health issue um, going into schools opening schools is going to be more difficult if we are if we're in the middle of an environment where we have a high number of cases bringing back MSU students is going to be more difficult if we have <clears throat> ongoing transmission the way we do right now we're going to work with schools I am open to the idea of schools opening up um, I think they're looking at a lot lot of good ideas for ways to, to do that in a safe way. Um, what I'll say is, as a community, one thing we could do to really help the schools is work work together now to reduce transmission of the disease so that schools didn't have to operate in an environment with so much disease. All right. Uh, thanks again for your time, Matt. We appreciate it. It's uh, Matt Kelly. He is the Gallatin County Health Officer. Again, the meeting is Friday, 7 a.m. Why, why is the meeting so early? Our board of health meetings are always at 7 a.m. We have a volunteer board, so we meet on the fourth Thursday of every month at 7 a.m. <clears throat> gives board members a time to get to the meeting and then go to their day job. Board members are not are not paid, and they're not they're not um, um, they're not full time employees. So we do what we can to to accommodate them. So that's nothing new. That's something that we've been doing for ever since I've been health officer. It's been a 7 a.m. board meeting on Thursdays. If uh, <clears throat> if people want to be a part of the Zoom on the virtual meeting, is there a limit on that? No, no. So you could have 5,000 people tuned in on through Zoom to, to be a part of that. My understanding is we're going to try to accommodate everybody who wants to be a part of it. Okay. All right, Matt. Uh, take care, and thanks again. We appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Have a good day.